Chapter Sixteen of the Mikado Jewel by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Sixteen Lovers. Next morning, it occurred to the squire that he had dismissed Pentreddle too abruptly, or rather, since the man wished to go, had given him leave too easily. A thousand and one questions came into his mind, which he desired to ask and which he should have put to the sailor during their hurried interview but a recollection that harry was stopping at hendle and was holding himself at the disposal of his feudal chief modern style reconciled him to the oversight and he decided that the second examination would be a longer one i shall drive over to hendle to-day and cross-examine him thought the squire and completing his toilet he descended to breakfast with an excellent appetite at the meal he heard news for akira stated that he would have to return that day to london as his chief wanted him but i am coming down again in a few days said the japanese stealing a glance at mara who sat opposite him rosy-faced and interested in my yacht i didn't know you had a yacht akira said basil with the keen interest of a sailor in his craft oh yes replied the count composedly a very good yacht my friend i have much money you know and have taken to your english ways so far as to buy a steam yacht later i propose returning to my own country in her colpster was frankly relieved that akira intended to leave he did not for one moment connect him with those who were hunting or who had been hunting for the mikado jewel but while that curious object was in the house he preferred the count's absence to his presence there was no doubt that if the little man did learn how the gem had returned to its original possessors that he would clamour for its restoration to kitzuki and that was not to be thought of for one moment the squire had not yet solved the problem as to why the jewel had been sent to him or how the sender had known that its presence was desired at beckley hall by its master he would have liked to question akira for if a priest according to pentreddle had snatched the emerald from patricia akira as a japanese would best be able to explain that same priest's reasons for sending it to devonshire but it was obviously impossible to ask such a question so colpster contented himself with expressing regret that the count had been compelled to cut short his stay at the hall i trust when you return in your yacht you will at least complete your interrupted visit by sleeping under my roof said colpster thank you no sir replied the japanese politely i shall remain on my boat for the few days i stay here and i hope he added with a comprehensive bow to all present that you will allow me to return your great hospitality mr colpster by giving an entertainment on board an entertainment cried mara and her eyes sparkled yes a japanese entertainment with japanese food and drinks and amusements miss colpster it will be a change for you and no doubt will give you a great deal of pleasure it will give us all pleasure said patricia smiling for the black eyes of the little man were fixed on her face then i ask you all to my entertainment even your servants must come mr colpster they never see anything unusual down here so it will amuse them to see how we japanese live i presume added akira with an attempt at humour that you can allow this house to be empty for one night oh yes said theodore laughing there are no robbers about here in that case i hope my invitation will be accepted certainly count and thank you for the invitation observed the squire in a hearty manner on behalf of myself my family and my household i accept akira bowed that is good sir for as i depart for my own country after i leave this place in my yacht i will not see you again for many a long year i have to remain at tokyo for official business but i have had a delightful stay here he looked round pleasantly and you will see all of you how i can return your kindness but won't you be tired travelling to london to-day said theodore quickly the count's piercing eyes seemed to look the questioner through and through as if inquiring why he had asked this particular question 
i retired early last night as you know mr dane he said quietly and so i am not at all weary dane he turned sideways to basil you will drive me to hendle you must allow me to do that count put in the squire i have to go to hendle on business to-day thank you sir you show true hospitality basil felt uneasy as he did not know if the guest spoke ironically or not and resolved to test the matter i can come also to akira ah but no it is not necessary akira held up a protesting hand i shall enjoy the drive with your uncle stay here and we shall meet again on board the miko mara started the miko she cried eagerly and with shining eyes the name of my yacht miss colpster i named her after the divine dancer the girl looked as though she wished to ask further questions but a significant glance of patricia's directed towards the squire who knew nothing about the miko dance made mara more prudent she rose abruptly from the table and shortly the rest followed her example akira went to see that his servant was packing his things properly and basil accompanied him as for theodore he followed his uncle into the library and closed the door what did pentreddle say to you last night he asked anxiously it's a long story said colpster sitting down to look over his correspondence he will tell it to you himself i am driving over to hendle and will bring him back with me akira i can drop at the station to catch the afternoon express i should like to come also uncle as i am so anxious to hear it harry's story there is no room in the brougham for you said colpster coldly and showed very plainly by this unnecessary lie that he did not wish for his nephew's company theodore frowned he knew that he was no favourite at least uncle give me a short account of what you heard the squire at first refused but theodore was so persistent that in the end he was obliged to yield and hastily ran through the story what do you think he asked when he ended i expect harry is right and that the priest with the scar murdered his mother no doubt the man learned why harry was hanging round the home of art and laid his plans accordingly but martha did not possess the emerald insisted the squire doubtfully the priest did not know that at the time said dane grimly his accomplice watched harry apparently while the man with the scar watched the crook street house he must have induced martha to let him in she might have thought it was her son you know then when she grew frightened and threatened him with her stiletto he used it against her and having murdered the poor old thing finally searched the house colpster nodded he could see no other solution of the mystery curious though that the priest did not get caught by the police oh according to the evidence the fog was very bad and one policeman confessed in print that he did not patrol the cul-de-sac carefully pity he did not catch the brute oh said colpster with a grim look harry will see that the man is punished he is going from amsterdam in a tramp steamer to japan for that very purpose i can't understand said theodore after a pause and tapping the desk with his long fingers why harry didn't give me the emerald when he met me it would have saved all this trouble the squire coughed in rather an embarrassed manner he could scarcely tell theodore that harry acting under his mother's instructions wished particularly to prevent him from gaining possession of the jewel he therefore shrugged his shoulders and evaded the question there are many things we cannot understand in connection with this case quite so said theodore with an uneasy look at the safe particularly why the mikado jewel should have been sent to you uncle he added after a pause get rid of it sell it pawn it return it to akira to take back to japan but send it out of the house i beg of you why demanded colpster drawing his brows together are you mad theodore wiped the perspiration from his high white forehead on the contrary i am particularly saying you heard what akira said about the reverse power possibly bringing the cliff down on the house oh rubbish said the squire roughly akira doesn't know that the gem is in this house 
all the more reason for believing that he spoke truly said dane with a desperate look i am sure the thing is evil there is now an indrawing power as you know miss carroll felt it i don't believe in all this rubbish patricia is a fanciful girl said colpster coldly the emerald is in my possession and i intend to keep it if you dare to tell akira about it theodore i shall send you out of the house and will never recognize you again as my nephew i am not so sure but what i would prefer to be out of the house while that damn thing is in it said theodore between his teeth you are playing with fire uncle see that you don't get burnt and with this warning he departed leaving the old man looking after his back contemptuously he was a very material man was the squire and considered that his nephew was an ass for believing in things which which could not be proved by arithmetic theodore was not happy in his mind when akira and colpster departed for there were many matters which worried him basil as usual was following patricia about the house and that was one grievance now that mara would not marry him he would certainly lose the chance of inheriting through her the desirable acres of beckley and that was another grievance finally the presence of the charmed mikado jewel in the house troubled him very much indeed he felt certain that granny lee's prophecy concerned it since akira had spoken of the occult powers of the stone and patricia had felt the reversion of the power so theodore uneasily considered that it was just possible that the cliff might be shaken down in ruins on the house he went out and looked at its mighty height almost expecting to see signs of crumbling but of course there were none the red cliff stood up boldly and gigantically as it had stood for centuries past the sight of its massive grandeur rather reassured theodore it's all rubbish he muttered to himself coming in out of the rain for all the morning there had been a downpour i dare say i am making a mountain out of a molehill all the same his eyes fell on the safe in the library in it he knew was the jewel safely locked away to shift the mikado emerald he would need to shift the safe and that was impossible oh it is all rubbish he declared again and then went to his own rooms on the way he passed the library and saw mara lying on the cushions of the sofa stringing beads onyx turquoise malachite pink coral and slivers of amethyst they gleamed like a rainbow as they slid through her deft hands theodore wondered where she got them and entered to inquire count akira gave them to me said mara gaily and tried the effect of the glittering chain against her pale golden hair aren't they lovely yes but your father won't like you taking presents from that infernal japanese mara said theodore crossly his nerves were so upset that he felt it would relieve him to vent his temper on some one mara sprang to her feet like a small fury and her face grew darkly red as her pale eyes blazed with anger you have no right to speak in that way of count akira i love him i don't care who hears me i love him she sat down again suddenly i wish he would take me to japan she ended viciously mara theodore was horrified a japanese well i was one ages ago she retorted i don't believe it yes you do you know too much about these occult things to disbelieve theodore as a matter of fact did believe but he did not intend to confess as much you can't be sure he snapped furiously i can be sure and i am sure said mar mutinously since i danced the round of the divineress and heard the music it all has come back to me i remember the temple of kitsuki quite well and the ceremonies oh i wish i could go back there it is my native land theodore looked at her stealthily and his eyes glittered as an idea struck him hard would you go if akira took you yes mara wet her lips and stared at him perhaps he will take me she said softly he is coming back in his yacht you know if you went your father would disown you i don't care you would lose beckley i don't care you would be cut off from your own race i don't care you are a fool shouted theodore savagely i'll tell your father 
mara wreathed her many-hued beads artistically round her neck and admired herself in the mirror over the fireplace but she also had a glimpse of her cousin's face and spoke from what she read written thereon no you won't theodore she observed coolly and meaningly you would be glad to see me run off with count akira and give up everything why should i be glad demanded dane taken aback by this shrewd reading of his most secret thoughts because as you say my father would have nothing to do with me and you would inherit beckley i am safe in your hands there is no chance for me said theodore tartly failing you basil would inherit i don't think so if he marries patricia uncle george likes patricia i know that so do we all but i don't think he would like basil to marry her in fact mara faced him i believe that father would like to make patricia my stepmother what theodore was now really astonished it's absurd i don't see that father is still a young man for his years and oh rubbish nonsense theodore broke furiously into her speech and fairly ran out of the room to think over the problem thus presented to him he believed that what his cousin said was perfectly true as mara was an observant young person in spite of her dreamy ways then he remembered how colpster always professed to admire patricia and did so loudly he was always asking her if she liked the place and what he could do for her and telling her that he hoped she would stay there for the rest of her life theodore drew a long breath i see what the old man is up to he considered as mara won't marry either basil or myself he intends to marry patricia in the hope of having an heir to the estate that would be an end to everything not that i believe the girl would have him and yet of this theodore could not be sure as he judged miss carroll by his own greedy self could any girl penniless as he knew patricia to be resist the offer of so beautiful a home dane thought not and set his wits to work to bar any possible chance of this very unexpected thing coming to pass to do so he had only to throw patricia into basil's arms and he believed that he knew how to do that i'll ask her to marry me thought theodore with an evil smile and then basil will be so furious that he'll ask her she hates me and loves him so in the end they will become engaged then uncle george will kick them both out of the house mara evidently intends to elope with akira when he returns in his yacht the little beast said that the boat after leaving here was going straight to japan that will settle her ha i shall be the only person left to console uncle george so he must as a reasonable man leave me the property i can see it all thus arranging his plans he went away to find patricia and force her into basil's arms he was sorry to lose the girl because of her psychic powers but as she plainly hated him he saw that easily there was not any chance for him since he could not make use of her in one way he therefore decided to make use of her in another through her basil could be got rid of and then mara would ruin herself by eloping with akira dane rubbed his hands with delight at the prospect thus opened out before him he even forgot his uneasiness over the mikado jewel and ceased for the moment to remember the sinister prophecy of mrs brenda lee of course it was necessary to act a comedy so as to accomplish his aims and he suspected that he would suffer pain during his acting if he insulted patricia which he intended to do basil would assuredly knock him down but if the sailor did that he would be obliged to declare his love for patricia if only to prove his rights to be her champion and what did a little pain matter to the prospective owner of beckley hall the schemer found the pair in the smoking-room a cosy and somewhat modern apartment for the house which was in the west wing it possessed a large plate-glass window which looked down the vista where the trees were cut down to the beach and the waters of the bay patricia knitting a silk tie sat on the sofa near the window while basil lounged in a deep armchair smoking his pipe the two were laughing when theodore entered 
but suddenly became serious when they saw who had disturbed them it was strange that the elder dane should always produce a dull impression on the gayest of people perhaps it was owing to the uncanny and disagreeable atmosphere which he always carried about with him what's the joke asked the newcomer throwing himself into an armchair opposite to that in which his brother sat nothing said basil shortly and his brow wrinkled what do you want to smoke a cigarette replied theodore producing his case the room is free to all isn't it quite free said patricia colouring for she did not like his tone when the two brothers were together she was always apprehensive of trouble for this reason and because she hoped to throw oil on troubled fraternal waters did she refrain from leaving the room yet there yet theodore's look was so insolent that she half rose to do so i must don't go patricia said the elder brother hastily mr dane i do not like you to call me by my christian name she said and her colour grew deeper than ever she rose to her full height now and made ready to go theodore doesn't know what he is saying muttered basil in a tone of suppressed rage and his brother looking at him mockingly saw that his face was as crimson as that of patricia's really i seem to be like the goddess of discord went on the intruder intent upon bringing about a catastrophe you seem jolly enough when, when i entered laughing and talking and will be jolly again when you leave snapped basil savagely i dare say but you shan't have miss carroll all to yourself no don't go miss carroll you see that i am addressing you with all respect he rose and slipped between her and the door as he spoke i want basil to see that you like me as much as you do him patricia looked nervous and her feelings were not soothed when basil rose in his turn go away miss carroll he said sternly and the veins on his forehead stood out with rage i can deal with theodore theodore can deal with himself said that gentleman turning on his brother with a black look on his face you are always taking up patricia's time and i have a right to it also yes he faced to the startled girl i intend to call you patricia because i love you i want you to marry me theodore are you mad thundered basil furiously is it mad to ask a girl's hand in marriage sneered theodore patricia stopped the further speech of basil with an imperative gesture and looked at theodore i am well able to take care of myself she said quietly mr dane i thank you for your offer but i decline it oh i am not so handsome as basil i am not so rich as uncle george take care take care breathed basil savagely in his ear but patricia again stopped him her temper rose and her eyes sparkled in an angry fashion what do you mean by your reference to mr colpster you want to marry him and ah keep off theodore flung out his hands with a scream as basil hit out the blow caught him fairly in his left eye and he reeled towards the window to fall on the sofa you bully he fairly sobbed apologize to miss carroll or by heaven i'll break your neck raged basil standing over the flabby man with clenched fists patricia admiring her strong lover came forward and laid her hand on his arm imploringly leave him alone basil he is not worth hitting theodore struggled to his feet and with his rapidly swelling eye presented a miserable spectacle basil he screamed and his rage was partly real so you call him basil and no doubt that that is for him you are knitting oh he burst into mocking laughter and pointed a finger at them both so this is how you are carrying on this is he got no further basil breaking from patricia sprang forward and catching theodore's bulky body in his powerful arms fairly flung him through the window with a mighty heave patricia gasped with surprise and delight as the glass smashed and theodore swung across the grass and down the slope like a stone fired from a catapult you devil roared basil shaking his fist through the broken window i'll kill you if you come near me or patricia oh he's dead gasped the girl clinging to the sailor not he see 
and sure enough theodore with his face convulsed with impotent rage rose heavily and limped out of sight i've settled him the hound and now he looked at her meaningly patricia shrank back flushing like a sunset mr day you called me basil just now and you shall call me basil for the rest of your life you would not marry theodore but he said masterfully you shall marry me yes whispered patricia yielding to his embrace i always loved you my darling my darling my darling cried the delighted sailor straining her to his breast theodore meant to part us but he only succeeded in bringing us together and he kissed her again and again he little knew how theodore had schemed to bring about that very kiss End of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of the mikado jewel by fergus hume this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Berard. chapter seventeen trouble misfortunes rarely come singly theodore was so damaged by basil that he was compelled to keep to his rooms and had his meals sent up to him apart from his physical pain the schemer was very satisfied with the result of the comedy he had played in the smoking-room lurking unseen at the corner of the house he had beheld patricia in his brother's arms and could believe the evidence of his own eyes that the rubicon had been crossed nevertheless he felt a pang at losing the girl for apart from her psychic powers which would have been extremely useful to him in his studies she was so pretty and charming that a less susceptible man than dane would have regretted the success of another but theodore had by this time decided that he could not have his cake and eat it so it was necessary to lose either beckley or patricia it was characteristic of his greedy nature that he had sacrificed the girl for the estate no doubt mara's hint that she might go with akira to japan had urged him to the course he had adopted for with both his brother and his cousin out of the way dane did not see how he could lose beckley he was the only one save these two who had the colpster blood in his veins and even though his uncle disliked him he could scarcely pass him over with aching limbs theodore lay snug in bed building castles in the air next day he intended to arouse the old man's jealousy by telling him of the embrace of the kisses and of the probable engagement then the lovers would be turned out of the house later when akira came round in his yacht mara would go and he would be lord of all he surveyed no wonder theodore chuckled but then came the second misfortune and an even more unexpected one mr colpster was brought back from hendel with a broken leg he had duly driven akira and his servant to the railway station but had failed to find harry pentreddle at his lodgings rather annoyed the old man had left a note saying that the sailor was to come to beckley and stay the night so that he might repeat his story to the danes and then had turned homeward but on the winding road which led down to the hall the horse had slipped on the rain-soaked ground and mr colpster having foolishly tried to get out had been thrown over the high bank the coachman was uninjured although with the horse and vehicle he had rolled down the slope but the squire had been picked up insensible by some labourers who had seen the accident and had been carried into his own house with a broken leg much concerned basil and patricia had the squire put to bed and sent for a doctor mara in an indifferent way expressed her sorrow although she never offered to nurse her father instead of helping she went up to her cousin's room to tell him of the accident not finding him in the sitting-room she knocked at his bedroom door and stood amazed to find that he as she supposed had gone to rest are you ill theo she asked crossing to the bed theodore groaned i had a row with basil and he threw me out of the window mara clapped her hands and her eyes sparkled how strong he is she said which was not the sympathetic speech theodore desired to hear why did he fight you theo 
i asked patricia to marry me and basil cut up rough no wonder said mara disdainfully why any fool could have seen that basil is in love with patricia he won't let anyone come near her oh she clapped her hands again and laughed gaily <laughs> i should have liked to see you flying through the window little beast you are snarled theodore i'm all aches and pains and my eye is black where he struck me damn him would you like to see the doctor no it's not worth sending to hendle for the doctor besides he only chatter i know these local gossips but the doctor is coming here you had better let him examine you theo theodore from the shadow of the curtains stared at the delicate face of his cousin why is the doctor coming oh i quite forgot what i came up to tell you about said mara in a matter-of-fact tone father has broken his leg broken his leg with a groan of pain theodore hoisted himself on one elbow how did he do that the horse slipped coming down the winding road jarvis could not hold him up and they all fell over the bank father tried to get out and broke his leg but jarvis and the horse are all right ended mara cheerfully i don't believe you are sorry said theodore angered at her indifference i don't see what is the use of crying over spilt milk replied the girl calmly if i cried my eyes out and tore my hair it would do father no good you might at least pretend to be sorry for him growled dane sinking back well i am it's horrid to suffer pain i'll tell him i'm sorry if you tell him in that voice he'll box your ears said theodore grimly you don't display much sorrow for me young lady because i don't feel any said mara coolly you brought it on yourself for i told you that basil loved patricia besides i don't like you i'm not a japanese eh no you're not anything half so nice would you like basil to come and see you she added maliciously i'm afraid patricia can't as she's attending to father oh get out of the room and tell the cook to send up my dinner to me here as soon as she can when i'm up again i'll tell uncle george everything what do you mean i shall tell him that basil and that infernal girl are engaged and he'll give her notice to quit and i shall tell him that you intend to run away with that beastly little japanese oh i haven't made up my mind what to do said mara retreating to the door and if i decide to go with akira i shall do so in spite of father or anyone else but you won't tell theo you're only too glad for me to go you look like a great toad lying in bed theodore caught up one of his slippers will you clear out mum 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 jeered mara with an elfish laugh you can't do anything and even if i do go even if basil does marry patricia you won't get beckling mum 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 and she closed the door just in time to escape the slipper which theodore threw with all his strength the doctor duly arrived and put the squire's leg in splints the old man had recovered his senses and considering his pain behaved himself very well the doctor approved of his patient's fine constitution and cheerfully said that he would soon be on his legs again you're not dead yet sir he remarked when colpster had been made comfortable for the night i don't intend to die said the squire coolly quite other plans are in my mind but while i lie here i shan't have anything disturbed in my house patricia remember that should akira's yacht arrive you and mara and basil together with theodore and the servants can go to his entertainment oh we couldn't leave you like that mr colster said patricia quickly you can and you shall i hate a lot of fuss and then the doctor took patricia out of the room to explain that the patient must be kept very quiet else he would work himself into a fever humor him miss carroll humor him said the doctor as he took his leave to-morrow i shall come over and see him don't worry but patricia did worry not so much over the squire who was getting along fairly well considering his age as over the fracas with theodore 
she dreaded lest he might speak to the squire and then i should have to leave said patricia much distressed i don't see why dearest replied basil twining his brown fingers in her hair and wondering if god had ever created a more perfect woman the two were seated as usual in the smoking-room deeming that the safest place since the quarrel had carefully avoided entering it it was now three days since the accident and since basil had been driven to disclose his feelings they had the house to themselves almost entirely for mara rarely troubled them theodore although he had risen from his sick-bed with a more or less discoloured eye kept to his own rooms and did not even present himself at meals he cherished a deep anger against basil and was sullen with patricia as the original cause of his humiliation the elder dane had not a forgiving nature nor indeed did his brother feel inclined to welcome any advances he was too much disgusted with theodore to pardon him readily i don't see why dearest said basil again and slipped his arm round patricia's waist uncle george can't kill us he could turn me out of the house and i have nowhere to go there is no reason why he should turn you out he loves you like a daughter i'm certain of that patricia sighed you are wrong basil he loves me certainly but not like a daughter what basil scowled with a brow of thunder does he dare to he dares nothing interposed patricia hurriedly and placed her pink palm over his mouth to prevent further speech but i am certain that he wants to marry me at his age ridiculous why ridiculous older men than the squire have married basil's arm grew loose round her waist do you admire him then of course i both admire him and love him look how good he has been to me i hadn't a shilling when he took me from the home of art patricia do you mean to say she stopped him again and this time his mouth was closed with a kiss i mean to say that you are a dear old stupid thing darling i can't help myself if your uncle admires me it shows his good taste all the same i'm going to marry you my dear but we'll both be turned out of the house i'm sure of that basil hugged her again i knew you would never marry for money dearest he whispered and if we are turned out we can live on my pay i have to join the mediterranean fleet when my leave is up in a couple of months from now my ship will be always at malta always calling in there you know we'll get a tiny flat and you shall stay there when we're married oh darling that will be heaven it will be poverty said basil ruefully not what you're used to my dear she put her arm round his neck and looked into his hazel eyes what nonsense you talk since my father died i have been desperately hard up in every way and if your uncle had not taken pity upon me i really don't know what i should have done i can cook and sew and look after a house splendidly i'm just the wife for a hard-up sailor you are indeed said basil fervently and would have embraced her but that a knock came at the door oh hang it here's sims i must attend to my duties said patricia as sims entered it's the butcher of course go on sims i'm coming to the kitchen and sims discreetly departed with a knowing smile while patricia remained for a last kiss the beckley hall servants saw very plainly what was taking place and even although they were old and jealous retainers did not resent it basil was an immense favourite with one and all while patricia during the short time she had acted as housekeeper had captured all hearts with great ease in the days which followed patricia was kept closely in attendance on the squire since mara would do nothing and colpster objected to being attended to wholly by the servants she became rather pale and thin which only made her the more adorable in basil's eyes and unfortunately in the eyes of her patient also the squire had made up his mind to ask patricia to be his wife notwithstanding the difference in their ages since mara resolutely refused to marry either of her cousins culpster's pet scheme for the family to be re-established 
now that the emerald had returned fell to the ground failing this he wished to make miss carroll his wife and hoped that she would give him an heir in the direct line of descent the more he thought of the scheme the more he liked it as he was extremely fond of patricia notwithstanding he had been so rude to her on the night when the mikado jewel had arrived so mysteriously it never struck him that she might fall in love with a handsome young man like basil patricia saw how devoted the old man was becoming to her and at times she was quite embarrassed by the youthful fire of his eyes colpster was now getting well rapidly as it was a fortnight since the accident and the leg was mending he remained of course in bed and received various visits from the various members of his household theodore and mara did not pay many visits as the former knew that his uncle disliked him and the latter was entirely without affection the squire never did expect much from mara as he looked upon her as weak-minded she certainly was not but her father never took the trouble to see what qualities she possessed it was little wonder that mara did not give affection seeing that she never received any mr colpster worried a great deal over the continued absence of harry pentreddle and had frequently sent jarvis to hendel to inform him that he was wanted at the hall but pentreddle had gone away from his lodgings without leaving any message behind and no one not even isa lee knew where he was to be found this absence and silence made the squire quite uneasy especially when he remembered that harry had seen the emerald he had stolen it before and as the squire without any grounds to go upon considered he might steal it again haunted by this thought colpster gave patricia the key of the safe and made her bring him the jewel he slept with it under his pillow and hugged it to his heart every day talking meanwhile about the good luck it would bring it has not brought any good luck yet mr colpster said patricia one evening after her love-making with basil in the smoking-room how do you mean my dear well in the first place you have broken your leg in the second you have lost that lawsuit which the squire groaningly interrupted her yes i have lost it worse luck my dear the land has gone and my income will be diminished to eight hundred yes i admit that bad luck and the weather is really terrible too he added looking at the streaming window-pane it so rarely rains here yet it has poured ever since my accident and before then patricia reminded him the rain by making the road slippery caused your accident if i were you mr colpster i would send back the jewel to japan with count akira he is quite right the good luck it brought to your family centuries ago has changed to bad how can you believe in such rubbish groaned the squire hugging miss jem you believe in it said miss carroll wondering at his want of logic or you would let the mikado jewel go the luck will change now insisted colpster trying to persuade himself into a kindly belief everything will come right i hope so said patricia poking the bedroom fire before which she was kneeling you must write and tell me if it does the squire sat up in bed and gasped write and tell you yes i am going away nonsense why should you go away mr colpster said patricia who had brought the conversation round to this point that she might thoroughly explain herself you have been very good to me and i have been very happy here but your nephew theodore has been rude to me in fact he has insulted me so i cannot remain under the same roof with him what the squire's scanty hair bristled and he trembled with rage has that dog of a theodore been rude he shall leave my house at once no that would not be fair he is your nephew i shall go i shan't let you go child i love you too much to let you go how did he insult you what did he say tell me and i'll i'll rage choked his further utterance and he sank back on his pillows the nurse came forward and smoothed the bedclothes don't worry over the matter mr colpster it's not worth it it's worth everything when you want to leave how did theodore insult you patricia looked down and sketched out figures with the tip of her bronze shoe he is angry because i am engaged 
to basil colpster flung himself forward and caught her wrist his sunken eyes filled with angry fire you are not engaged to basil he said fiercely but i am leave go my wrist mr colpster or i shall go away at once he still held her tightly you shan't marry basil you shall marry me patricia was greatly indebted to the old man as she had admitted and was sorry for his misplaced passion but she was also a woman with a woman's feeling and did not intend to allow him to dictate to her with a dexterous twist she freed herself from his grip and retreated to a safe distance if you behave like this i shall leave the room and never enter it again she exclaimed angry at his want of self-control the threat brought the squire to his knees no no don't go he cried in piteous tones i can't live without you i wish to marry you see patricia dear i shall settle beckley on you and when the emerald brings back the good luck you shall the emerald will only bring bad luck said patricia interrupting coldly and if you had millions i would not marry you i love you as a daughter and i thought that you loved me in the same way basil and i are engaged and intend to get married in a few months he has no money wailed the squire clutching the sheets no money i don't care he is the man i love he has no right to ask you to marry him if he had not asked me mr colpster i believe i should have asked him was the girl's quick answer can't you understand that he is the only man in the world for me if you don't then the sooner i leave this house the better you have no right to dictate to me and i won't allow it i'll cut basil out of my will i shall leave the property to theodore that is a matter for your own consideration said patricia coldly now it's time for your beef tea and i must go and get it i shan't take it cried the squire childishly mr colpster for a man of your years you are very silly my years my years you reproach me with those i reproach you with nothing said miss carroll tired of the futile argument can't you see that if you go on like this i must leave no don't he implored with wild eyes i'll be good very well she said in a matter-of-fact tone now i shall get your beef tea and for that purpose she left the room left alone mr colpster whimpered a little he was old he was sick and he was very sorry for himself he had sought to woo a girl who was young enough to be his daughter and his wooing had taken the fashion of trying to bribe her with house and land and money to this insult she had retorted by showing him the mother that is hidden in every woman married or unmarried he felt like a naughty boy who had been put in the corner and at his age he did not like the new experience he could have kicked himself for having gone on his knees to be whipped for that was what it amounted to in the darkness it was evening and there was no light in the big bedroom save that of the fire he flushed and burned with shame how indeed could she having found her mate in a young man of her own age beautiful and ardent as she was be expected to accept his philistine offer of beeves and land the squire with all his oddities was a gentleman and as he came from a brave race he was a man his age his fantasy about refounding the family his sickness had all landed him in the slough it behoved him if he wished ever again to look at his ancestors portraits in the face to get out of the quagmire and reassert his manhood as well as his good breeding patricia should marry basil and become his niece-in-law mara could be given an income to indulge in her fantasies and he could live at beckley with mr and mrs colpster which was to be the married name of the young couple in the middle of these visions patricia returned with the beef tea and a lamp the naughty boy came out of his corner to beg pardon my dear he said in an apologetic voice i'm an old fool oh no said patricia kindly you are just one who has cried for the moon i give the moon to basil said the squire holding out his hand and he will be my heir forgive me willingly said miss carroll 
and they shook hands gravely but i agree with you sighed colpster ending the scene the jewel has brought bad luck end of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of the mikado jewel by fergus hume this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter eighteen pleasure count akira did not return so soon to beckley as he had promised for he wrote that official business still detained him in london but during the third week after his departure his yacht the miko steamed into the ferry bay and cast anchor a quarter of a mile off shore it was basil who espied her first immediately after breakfast and he ran up a flag on the pole erected on the lawn the miko dipped her ensign in reply and shortly a boat put off which doubtless was bringing akira on his return visit basil walked down to the beach to meet him there was a tiny pier on the right of the beach which ran into deep water and the boat made for this basil with his hands in his pockets stared at the yacht she was a graceful boat of some two thousand tons and her hull was painted white while her one funnel was darkly blue the chrysanthemum flag of japan streamed from one of her mastheads and she looked a singularly beautiful object as she rocked on the blue waters of the bay basil judged from her lines that she was swift but he had little time to take in much as the boat which approached at a furious pace was a small steam launch she came alongside the pier in a few minutes and how is my good friend dane asked akira hoisting himself up like a monkey and removing his cap you see i am here as promised they shook hands and basil thought that akira looked very workmanlike in his smart blue yachting dress a wiry brown lithe little man was the japanese keen-eyed and alert the most casual observer could see that if necessary he could make himself very disagreeable i am glad to see you again akira said basil come up to the house the count gave a few directions to the officer in charge of the launch and then placed himself at his friend's disposal all are well in your family i hope he remarked as they strolled up through the woods my uncle has broken his leg i regret to say indeed akira looked shocked i am very sorry how did it happen basil gave him a hasty description of the accident in fact akira he added with a puzzled look since you went away everything has gone wrong what do you mean asked the japanese quietly and his face became entirely devoid of emotion what i say my uncle broke his leg and has lost a lawsuit which he hoped to gain theodore and i have quarrelled and the house is as dull as tombs i hope miss carroll is not dull observed akira politely dane turned swiftly to observe the expression of the little man's face he had said more than he had meant to say on the impulse of the moment and now that he had said so much he deliberately said more apparently akira who was very sharp had noted during his visit symptoms of love-making it was just as well to let him know how matters stood for after all the japanese was not a bad little fellow miss carroll is engaged to marry me said basil drawing a deep breath i congratulate you but i am not surprised i saw much when i was here on my visit he paused then went on shrewdly i do not wonder that you have had a quarrel with your brother never mind that akira said basil hastily i really did not intend to tell you that it slipped out akira nodded you must permit me to send you and miss carroll a present from my own country when i reach it he remarked changing the subject it is very good of you i am sure miss carroll will be delighted when do you sail for the east to-morrow i have secured an excellent appointment at tokyo it is very good of you to anchor here and delay your journey said basil cordially and akira gave a little laugh as the young man spoke oh i had a reason he said coolly i never do anything without a reason dane i shall tell my reason to mr colpster if he is to be seen 
oh yes he is out of bed although he has not yet left his room the leg is mending splendidly and he lies mostly on the sofa in his bedroom i am sure he will be delighted to see you and miss mara will she be delighted basil again gave a side glance but was far from suspecting why the remark had been made don't you make her dance any more said dane nervously no i promise you that i won't do that answered akira his face again becoming so unemotional that basil could not tell what he was thinking about but you have not answered my question here is mara to answer for herself said dane and he spoke truly for as they advanced towards the front door of the house it opened suddenly and mara flew out with sparkling eyes count akira i am so glad to see you again is that your boat what a nice boat she is when did you arrive and what are mara 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 remonstrated basil laughing how can the man answer so many questions all at once i would need gargantua's mouth as your shakespeare says observed akira with a quiet smile and his eyes also sparkled at the sight of the girl come inside akira and i will tell miss carroll said dane hospitably he stepped into the house but akira did not follow immediately he lingered behind with mara and after a glance at the many windows of the house he gave her hand a friendly shake but his words were warmer than his gesture for they were meant for mara's private ear while the handshake was for the benefit of any onlooker i have come you see you are glad and his black eyes looked volumes mara nodded and from being a pale lily became a dewy rose of course did i not promise to love you for seven lives your father will not understand that said akira dryly mara started will you tell him she asked anxiously the count bowed stiffly i am a japanese gentleman he said in cool and high-bred tones and so i can do nothing against my honour i cannot take you with me unless your father consents but he will not breathed mara becoming pale with emotion he will already this morning he has received a long letter from me which i sent from london it explains how i love you and asks for your hand but you are not of my religion whispered mara distressed he may object to that i think not as your father from what i see is of no particular religion himself i have a special license in my pocket we can be married to-day in your own church and by your own priest when we reach japan we can be married according to shinto rites but your family i have my uncle in london on hearing all about you he has agreed there will be no trouble with my family mara still nervous would have asked further questions and would have put forward further objections but that patricia made her appearance at the door she looked singularly beautiful although she was not so in akira's eyes he preferred the small features and colourless looks of mara patricia's face was too boldly cut and too highly coloured to be approved of by an oriental how are you count said miss carroll shaking hands very well and you but i need not ask miss carroll akira laughed in a very sympathetic way for him dane has told me oh patricia blushed i wish you all happiness and may you be united for seven lives what does that mean i know i know cried mara clapping her hands and jumping in japan we all believe in reincarnation and lovers promise each other to love during seven earth seasons but you are not a japanese mara said patricia wondering that the girl should so boldly couple herself with akira yes i am mara asserted decidedly my body is english but my soul is japanese i now know that i was amigo in the temple of kitsugi three hundred years ago and that i loved him she pointed to akira who smiled assentingly oh what nonsense said miss carroll rather crossly it is your imagination you silly child and then before mara could contradict her she turned to the count mr colpster wants to see you she remarked will you follow me i want to come also said mara and grasping akira's hand she went into the house they looked at one another adoringly and smiled 
at the bedroom door patricia left them as the squire had intimated that he wished to see akira privately miss carroll therefore desired to take mara downstairs with her but the girl refused to go i have to speak to my father also she declared obstinately and i must do so while the count is present as you please replied miss carroll finding it impossible to move the girl and knowing mara's obstinate disposition of old you will find me in the library when you come down with basil cried out mara mischievously and patricia looked back to give a smiling nod then the two entered the bedroom mr colpster was lying on the sofa near a large fire wrapped in his dressing-gown and looked thin since his illness had rather pulled him down he also appeared to be somewhat cross and shook at akira several sheets of blue paper with an angry air i received your letter this morning he said sharply and without greeting his visitor in any way that is good said akira politely it will save me the trouble of an explanation mr colpster i think not growled the squire i must know more and in any case i do not intend to consent oh father you must cried mara indignantly go downstairs child said her father quickly i wish to speak alone with this this gentleman but mara stood her ground what the count has to say concerns me she declared obstinately i shan't go colpster stormed vainly while akira looked on passively but nothing would move mara from the position which she had taken up she simply laughed at her father and in the end he had to yield a grudging consent to her remaining in the room and now sir he said when this was settled and again shaking the sheets of blue paper at akira i understand from this that you wish to marry my daughter mara of course it is quite impossible why asked akira calmly and holding mara's hand because you are not an englishman spluttered the squire if i was a frenchman or a german you would not object retorted the count coolly why not say that it is because i am not a european very good then i say it you are of the yellow race and mara is of the white marriage between you is ridiculous i don't think so sir mara looked at her father disdainfully i don't know why you talk so she said with a shrug i intend to marry count akira to-day and go away with him to-morrow to japan in our yacht our yacht indeed echoed the squire angrily and then stared at the pale obstinate face of his daughter framed in a nimbus of feathery golden hair oh you are a minx you never loved me i can't help that said mara doggedly i never loved any one until i met with the count i couldn't understand myself until i danced that night in the drawing-room danced the miko kagura what is that what is she talking about colpster turned to akira the count explained politely when i came here sir i noticed that miss colpster was greatly interested in what i had to say about my own country and often when i told her of things she said that she remembered them how could that be when she has never been out of england that is what puzzled me until i one night by way of an experiment and to convince myself placed on the fire some incense used in the temple of kitsuki and played on a flute the music of the miko kagura which is a holy dance miss colpster rose and performed it perfectly then all the past came back to her as she told me later what past demanded the squire much bewildered the past of her life in japan three hundred years ago oh that is rubbish it is true cried mara in a thrilling voice and raised her arms i was a miko of the kitsuki temple three hundred years ago that is why i remembered about the emerald when theodore sent me into a trance and for the same reason i could describe the shrine i loved the count then when we wore other bodies and i promised to love him for seven lives this time i have been born in england but he has come for me here and i am going with him to my native land oh you are quite mad said colpster furiously mad or sane let me marry her mr colpster 
pleaded akira from my letter you can see that i am going to occupy an excellent official position at tokyo and that i am of very high rank in japan besides being wealthy i love your daughter because i truly believe strange as it may seem to you that we loved three hundred years ago i have a special license in my pocket and if you consent we can go to your church this day and get married according to your religion when we reach japan we shall be married according to mine do you consent no it's ridiculous you have only known mara a few weeks i have loved her for three hundred years insisted akira smiling i don't believe in that rubbish mara seized her lover's hand i am tired of all this she said in her old fashion why can't you leave me alone i marry the count colpster saw that whether he gave his consent or not she would certainly do so and after all as he asked himself what did it matter mara had never displayed any affection for any single person since she had always lived in a dream world of her own now that he had decided to leave the property to basil and patricia on condition that they assumed the name of colpster mara was unnecessary finally it was certain that she would be happier in japan than in england since there was evidently no future for her in the west the squire did not believe in reincarnation all the same he admitted that mara's many oddities suggested that she was a soul born out of time and place but that his daughter should marry one of the yellow race offended the old man's pride he was just about to open his mouth and refuse permission again when akira spoke blandly if you consent said akira i will send you someone who can tell you who killed your housekeeper how do you know asked colpster startled i have been making inquiries in town consent and you shall know all and consent said mara stepping up to her father and bending to whisper in his ear or i shall tell the count that you have the emerald colpster turned white how do you know he whispered back i saw you slip it under your pillow one day it is there now if you don't let me marry the count he shall take it from you now the squire breathed heavily and dark circles appeared under his sunken eyes as mara stepped back to stand beside her lover he knew that his daughter did not love him or any one else but he had never believed she would have spoken as she had done undoubtedly the theory of reincarnation was a correct one she was an eastern soul in a western body i consent to the marriage he said in cold dry hard tones you could go to the church on the moor and get the affair settled i cannot come myself but basil and patricia can go with you mara you had better tell your maid to pack your clothes since you leave to-morrow everything is already packed said mara turning at the door and looking cool and white and more shadowy than ever i shall come and say good-bye no don't shouted the squire as she went out you go also akira the count smiled blandly and walked to the door i shall keep my promise sir and to-night you will receive one who will be able to tell you the whole truth of what has puzzled you for so long when akira disappeared the squire tore up the blue letter and threw the pieces into the fire he had done with mara she was no longer any daughter of his and indeed she never had been always cold always indifferent a very shadow of what a daughter should have been he was well rid of her this traitress who would have surrendered the emerald colpster felt under his sofa pillow and pulled out the gem it was wrapped in paper and he enfolded this to gaze at it a knock at the door made him hastily smuggle it away again basil entered immediately and looked worried is it true uncle that akira and mara are to be married he asked abruptly quite true akira has brought down a special license go with patricia and see that all is shipshape but uncle george surely you don't want mara to marry a japanese what does it matter whether i give my consent or not mara will do what she wants to do there is some rubbish about reincarnation between them about loving for seven lives or for three hundred years i don't understand these things but what i do understand 
cried colpster with cold fury raising himself on his elbow is that mara does not love me and that i intend to cut her out of my will send jarvis to handle and tell curtis the lawyer to come over at once you will have the property basil and then can marry patricia theodore can go away i won't have him in the house after the way he has insulted your future wife as to mara she can go to the devil or to japan i never wish to set eyes on her again but what has she done asked basil bewildered the squire could have told him but did not intend to since that would mean revealing that the mikado jewel was under the sofa pillow never mind i am well rid of her and so are you and so are we all only see that this japanese marries her properly dane argued implored and stormed but all to no purpose his uncle vowed that if mara remained he would turn her penniless from the house and basil was sufficiently acquainted with his obstinate character to be certain that he would keep his word under the circumstances it seemed reasonable that mara should lie on the bed she had made and the young man making the best of a bad job went away to get patricia he would act as akira's best man and patricia could follow mara as her solitary bridesmaid whatever might be the outcome of this sudden arrangement basil determined to see that the marriage was legal and when he saw the joy and delight of mara and the lover-like attentions of akira he began to think that his uncle had acted for the best in the face of mara's obstinacy nothing else could be done although basil being a true englishman did not relish the japanese as a cousin-in-law all the same he approved of akira's fine qualities and knew that from a worldly point of view mara was making a brilliant match obeying instructions he sent jarvis for the hendle lawyer when with the prospective bride and bridegroom he and patricia were on their way to the quaint old church on the moor where so many colpsters were buried the clergyman could not disobey a special license so that was all right and he hoped to return later with the pair married indeed had basil possessed a special license himself he also would have stood before the altar with patricia but such things were far beyond the means of a poor lieutenant of his majesty's navy meanwhile the squire received curtis and made a new will which made no mention of mara and theodore but left the entire colpster estates to basil provided that he took the family name and married patricia carroll when the testament had been duly signed sealed and delivered the squire decided to keep it in his possession until the morrow so that he could show it to the young couple curtis wished to take it with him but colpster refused and finally departed without even a copy of the document however he promised to call the next day and take it with him for safety just as the lawyer departed theodore entered the bedroom what's all this about he asked sharply his uncle looked at him with a frown what do you mean entering my room without knocking he demanded in his turn i beg your pardon said theodore with forced lightness but everything seems at sixes and sevens since that infernal yacht came in all the servants are getting themselves ready to go to the entertainment to-night and i can't get anyone to answer my bell wait until miss carroll returns and she will see to things said colpster indifferently i can't be bothered where is miss carroll i have been in my room all day and when i came down i couldn't find any one basil and patricia have gone to attend the marriage of mara and akira theodore stepped back and then stepped forward he could scarcely believe his ears have you allowed that he asked in consternation yes akira is a good match and mara loves him but he's a japanese what does that matter i don't believe in marriages between members of different races colpster looked at him cynically what the devil does it matter what you believe i agreed to the marriage for two or rather for three reasons in the first place mara would have married in any case had i not consented in the second she threatened if i did not agree to tell akira about the emerald which he would then have taken from me in the third place akira said that if i agreed he would send someone to-night to tell me all about the murder of martha and reveal the name of the person who did it it was a priest with a scar on his cheek 
we did it said theodore in vigorous tones will he akira that is send him i don't know don't bother me said the squire turning over on his pillows i'll see him when you are all out of the house i'm not going to that infernal entertainment said theodore snappishly as i don't approve of mara marrying that yellow man i shall stay here and listen to what this emissary of akira's has to say oh do what you like do what you like only don't bother me said colpster again and very sharply clear out please all right theodore went towards the door only i want to say one thing curtis has been here have you cut mara out of your will yes although it is no business of yours when she marries akira she will have plenty of money well then i suppose said theodore shooting his arrow you know that patricia and basil are engaged yes i am aware of that and i wish them joy aren't you angry uncle theodore was astounded no why should i be i like patricia i fancy you loved her and wished to marry her colpster rolled over and glared fiercely he was annoyed that his secret should have been discovered by theodore of all people since he hated him so ardently i never did wish to marry patricia he said furiously and telling a smooth lie i look upon her as a daughter i have always looked upon her as a daughter when basil told me that she had consented to be his wife i was delighted i am delighted ah oh, growled theodore wincing and thrusting his hands deep into his pockets so you brought curtis over to alter your will yes i have left everything to basil and patricia what about me theodore by this time was ghastly pale oh you can go to the devil said his uncle carelessly you insulted miss carroll so i pay you out the will cutting you off is here he patted his pocket before theodore could express the rage which consumed him there came the sound of advancing feet and the laughter of happy people the door was suddenly thrown open by basil and patricia entered followed by the bridegroom and the bride arm in arm english fashion allow me said patricia gaily and in a ringing voice to present to you mr colpster the count and countess akira End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the mikado jewel by fergus hume this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. chapter nineteen the truth with the early darkness of february came a spectacle to delight and astonish the homestaying folk of beckley suddenly at eight o'clock when the entire household were gathered on the beach for transport in the launch to the yacht the miko became outlined in colored fire radiant and weird against the gloom in red and blue and yellow and green she flashed into being like a spectral flying dutchman never before had such a sight been seen in that quiet devonshire bay and loudly sounded the amazed voices of the servants praising the gorgeous illumination it was like magic to them and several were heard to express a hope that the devil was not on board the ship of light however the japanese officer in charge of the launch which puffed up spoke sufficient english to reassure them and they all embarked for an evening's revelry the bride and bridegroom with the two who had witnessed the marriage had long since gone on board mara did not intend to set foot on english soil again and had taken a final leave of her father colpster had not been unkind although his farewell had been rather cold but then the newly made countess akira was cold herself and rarely demonstrative so she did not mind in the least in fact patricia being a warm-hearted irish girl reproved her for the coolness with which she took leave both of her parent and of her childhood's home oh nonsense said mara with her usual cry i wish you'd leave me alone patricia i can't make a fuss when i don't feel the least sorry to go away but surely mara you are sad you leave your home your father your native land for ever it may be certainly for ever 
and now that i know all about the past now that i am the count's wife i don't look upon england as my native land mara you surely do not really believe that you lived at kitzuki as a priestess centuries ago said patricia shaking her head i am sure that i did i was a miko which means the darling of the gods did count akira tell you that translation no i remembered it i spoke japanese ages ago i am beginning to recollect all manner of things and akira gave me a book of lafcadio hearns which contains a description of a miko kagura it is exactly what i danced on that evening and is precisely what i did when i was at the temple patricia asked no more questions the problem was beyond her she saw that mara firmly believed in reincarnation and on that belief based her sudden marriage with akira the little man had known her only for a few weeks and in the ordinary course of things would not have fallen in love with her so rapidly if indeed at all seeing that he was east while she was west therefore it really seemed as if what mara believed was true and that she had met her husband before in the province of izumo in no other way could the puzzled patricia account for the unexpected which had happened so quickly and she agreed with basil that it was just as well that mara had obtained her heart's desire in this strange way had she not met akira she would have gone on living in an unhealthy dreamland and perhaps as she grew older would have lost her reason but now she seemed to be a different girl as her formerly pale face was rosy with colour she looked less shadowy and strangest of all she took a profound interest in the entertainments provided for the beckley servants this was particularly odd for mara never when she was single troubled about pleasures of any kind and certainly took no interest in the likes or dislikes of other people but over this revelry she presided like a queen and for the first time in her strange life she appeared to be thoroughly happy after all said patricia to her lover who stood by her while a sailor was singing some legend to the music of the viva the count is a very charming and highly bred man oh yes assented basil heartily for having taken everything into consideration he now quite approved of the turn affairs had taken he is one of the best is akira as good and clever a chap as ever lived if you do want courtesy and good breeding you can find them to perfection in a japanese gentleman mara is lucky to get such a husband considering what a strange nature she has it is that very nature which has brought such a husband to her said patricia i hope and trust and pray she will be happy i think so akira adores her strange when he is east and she is west patricia shook her head mara would never admit that my dear only her body is west according to her her soul is eastern well remarked basil looking somewhat puzzled i don't know much about this occult rubbish of which we have had so much lately but i should think that the soul was of no country at all it comes on the stage of the world dressed as a native of different countries just as it is told as its karma calls it what the deuce is karma the accumulated result of good and evil and look here patricia interrupted the young man slipping his arm within her own i have had enough of this jargon and occult rubbish i half believe in it and i half don't at all events i don't think it is healthy for either you or i to indulge in such things let us live as two healthy people my darling as we have plenty of work to do in this world before we leave it you agree don't you of course i do i should agree if you propose to cut off my head i prefer to leave it on your shoulders laughed basil and slyly stole a kiss for they were standing in the shadow look at old sims how amazed he is at those japanese dresses they pressed forward to look some of the sailors were arrayed as samurai in antique armor of the middle ages of japan and were fighting with huge swords all round flashed the many-coloured lights 
and the little group of devonshire folk sat and stood in their homely dresses looking delightedly at the fairyland which had been brought before their astonished eyes the dresses the music the unusual food and the brown faces of the foreign sailors fascinated them greatly and indeed the spectacle was as pleasant to basil and patricia as to them in spite of the fact that they knew more of the world beyond beckley as to mara she was flushed with enjoyment and so deeply interested in the brilliant spectacle before her that she did not notice the absence of her husband but he had slipped away silently and was standing at the stern of the yacht speaking softly to an englishman the light of a mere lantern would have shown any one who knew him that the man was harry pentreddle and he was just getting ready to lower himself by a rope into a rowing boat which was fastened alongside you can get ashore in that whispered akira softly and later i shall send you the launch to fetch you i can row back again protested pentreddle you won't be able to get away quick enough said akira mysteriously away from what never mind do what i told you to do and bring me what i told you to bring me obey my instructions implicitly or there may be danger but i don't understand sir you understand enough for my purpose broke in the japanese smooth voice and you know why i ask you to go ashore to the hall to-night yes i know said harry grimly and spat on his hands as he prepared to grasp the rope you needn't go unless you like i can go myself well for answer pentreddle clambered over the taffrail and swung himself by the rope into the small craft below as he took the oars akira's voice was heard again even softer than before as he leaned over the side the launch will be waiting for you at the pier when you come out he said lose no time the boat shot away into the gloom while harry pentreddle wondered why the little man was so insistent about his getting away quickly from the hall after what had to be done was accomplished however the sailor being aware of certain facts was prepared to obey implicitly and rowed hard to reach the land there was no time to be lost as the entertainment would not last for ever and it was necessary that harry should come back to the miko before those on board returned to beckley hall it was a calm night but cloudy and threatening the rain of the last few weeks had stopped and fine weather prevailed but no stars were visible and the moon was veiled heavily as pentreddle beached his boat near the pier and dug her anchor into the damp sand he felt a breath of wind and looked into the semi-gloom to see that already white crests were forming on the waves afar off the miko looked like a fairy ship with her coloured lights glittering against the darkness the wind was distinctly rising as pentreddle felt when he passed up the path to the hall and on glancing overhead he noted that the clouds were beginning to move already a few stars were revealed and there was an occasional glimpse of a haggard moon lying on her back it's going to be a nasty night said the sailor bad for those folk on board that yacht they'll be seasick he chuckled although he felt far from merry the errand he was on was too serious to be treated lightly and he was even nervous as to what would be the outcome of the same but he strode on resolutely nevertheless and was soon standing at the front door of the hall the building was in darkness save for one window on the second story near the angle of the wall pentreddle acquainted with the building ever since he could walk knew very well that this was one of the windows of the squire's bedroom on the other side of the wall there were two more for a moment pentreddle looked up at the light and noted that the tough arms of the ancient ivy grew up to the very sill of the window and afforded a ladder to any one who wished to descend in that way he smiled grimly when he recalled this fact which might be useful and then opened the door it had not been locked as there were no robbers at beckley and bolts and bars were not attended to very particularly the hall should have had the central lamp lighted but pentreddle found the place entirely dark 
he did not mind this as he knew every inch of the way up to squire colpster's bedroom there he would find the old gentleman and he presumed that mr dane who had refused to come to the entertainment on the miko would be in his rooms at the back of the house he walked softly up the stairs as he did not wish to arouse theodore for reasons which he intended to impart to the old squire feeling his way in the darkness along the walls and wishing that he had brought a lantern pentreddle gained the second story and walked along the corridor towards the line of light which shone from under the bedroom door on arriving immediately outside he paused for a moment to listen a sound of struggling struck his ear and he became aware with a thrill that there was a fight going on between uncle and nephew considering colpster's age this was unfair so pentreddle dashed open the door and shot into the room intent upon taking side with the weaker party what's all this he shouted help harry help he's strangling me gasped colpster recognizing the voice oh help me help pentreddle did not waste any time in words he darted forward and gripping the shoulders of theodore who was holding his uncle down on the floor he spun him to one side the squire struggling to his feet clawed at the sofa to rise on seeing which dane who was crazy with rage tried to slip past the sailor and tackle the old man again ah would you cried harry who hated theodore fervently as indeed every one did i'll show you and in a moment his sinewy arms were round the big man and they wrestled desperately theodore was ghastly white and his blue eyes blazed with unholy fire as between closed teeth he cursed his antagonist huge as he was the man had only that strength which comes with furious anger he was flabby and not at all muscular since he never exercised himself in any way half on the floor and half on the pillows of the sofa colpster watched the fight with breathless interest grasping in his hands a large envelope the two men swayed and swung round the apartment and theodore fought like a tiger but the wiry sailor was too much for him and gradually dane was forced to the floor where he lay struggling and kicking with pentreddle kneeling on his big chest harry hailed the half-fainting old man pull down that curtain cord near you squire and throw it over he panted dane gurgled and tried to curse but could not as pentreddle's brown hands gripped his fat throat colpster struggled across to the window and took with feeble hands the sunken rope which draped the curtains on one side at no great height from the floor he crawled back with it to harry who at once proceeded to bind theodore's arms behind his back and rolled him over for this purpose dane was so sick and breathless with the struggle and in such a bad condition for holding his own that he had to submit now the other rope squire commanded harry but seeing that the old man's strength had given out he darted across himself to the window and speedily brought back what he required in a few minutes theodore trussed like a fowl was lying on the floor face uppermost and regained his breath sufficiently to curse i'll have you arrested for this pentreddle he said viciously harry deigned no reply as he had to attend to colpster on a small table near the bed was a decanter of port with some glasses and a dish of biscuits the sailor poured out a glass of the generous vintage and held it to the squire's lips he drank it eagerly and demanded more a second glass brought the colour back into his wan cheeks and the light of life into his sunken eyes shortly he was able to sit up on the sofa and harry arranged the pillows at his back but all the time colpster held on to the large envelope also he fished about feebly under the pillow and brought out the mikado jewel thank heaven panted the old man feebly he has got neither i'll get them yet you old beast growled theodore trying to break his bonds but vainly i'll have that will and burn it i'll get the emerald and sell it curse you and you too pentreddle what the devil do you mean binding me in this way i'll explain that to you later sir retorted pentreddle wiping his brow and taking a glass of port himself with your permission squire he said in a polite tone when he drank it 
you arrived just in time said the squire in stronger tones that wicked wretch would have killed me why asked pentreddle quickly he came up here and insisted that i should destroy the will i made in favour of his brother and miss carroll here it is and colpster passed along the large envelope take it harry and give it to basil when he returns it is not safe here shall i take the emerald asked harry putting the envelope containing the will in the breast pocket of his pea-jacket colpster snatched the gem to his breast and nursed it there like a baby no 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 he cried vehemently i can't part with that i'll die before any one shall have it but me give me some more wine still clutching the jewel he drank another glass of port and became quite strong again with the stimulant meanwhile theodore lay stiffly on the carpet cursing volubly harry kicked him shut your mouth said the sailor or i'll gag you i'll have you arrested for this repeated theodore impotently scowling that's all right said pentreddle and drawing a chair near the sofa he turned to the squire now sir we must have a talk what's the matter asked colpster in some alarm where have you been to and where have you come from i'll tell you sir if you'll listen on the night i left here that japanese akira followed me up the road when i was making for my friend and the trap on the moors ah theodore groaned that was why he went to bed early i knew that he was up to some game he pretended to go to bed and and followed me quite right sir he did and he told me all about the murder of my poor mother what colpster gasped are you the person akira said he would send to tell me all that i wish to know pentreddle nodded grimly i am the person i went to london next day with count akira and he introduced me to a person who knew all about the murder i got it written down signed and witnessed in a proper manner then i came here with the count in his yacht and arrived just in time to save that devil he pointed to theodore from committing a second crime a second crime echoed the squire bewildered i don't understand it's a lie a lie howled theodore straining at his bonds if i were free i'd dash the lie down your throat and my teeth too you murdering beast said harry clenching his hands i i owe you one for the murder of my mother colpster sprang to his feet with surprising alacrity considering his late exhaustion murder did 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 he pointed a shaking finger at the mass on the floor did he murder martha yes said harry sadly it's a lie a lie muttered theodore again and again struggling fiercely it's the truth sit down mr colpster and i'll tell you all about it i have the document of an eye-witness signed and witnessed here he touched his breast pocket an eye-witness said colpster resuming his seat heavily yes that priest with the scar on his cheek i told you about who saw me watching the home of art he did it himself you fool roared theodore defending his lost cause so i thought and i was going out to japan to kill him but i know that you were with my mother on that night for the priest saw you enter the house by the window you tapped there and my mother let you in the priest was watching the house as he fancied the emerald might be there he got on to the balcony and peeped through the window he saw you struggle with my mother you brute and stab her then you left the room and hunted the house for the emerald when you came out the priest thinking you might have it waited at the gate and tried to seize you you escaped and he lost you in the fog but he retained hold of the white silk scarf you wore round your throat it is here pentreddle took a folded square of silk from his pocket and shook it out your name is in the corner your name in full hang you look squire look and harry his hands shaking with emotion pointed out the name theodore dane marked on the silk with blue thread you see sir he is guilty ah oh, the squire groaned 
as he saw the evidence of his nephew's wickedness and he laid the emerald on the table so that he could the more easily cover his face with his hands it's terrible terrible that one of my blood should be an assassin that one of my blood should be hanged oh he won't be hanged said harry refolding the silk scarf and replacing it in his pocket i am going to leave him to akira what what do you mean quavered theodore with sudden terror the young sailor walked over to him and looked into his face akira told me that he would attend to your punishment what he means i don't know but what i do know is that these japanese can make things very unpleasant for you i have heard of their ingenuity in torturing torturing theodore shrieked yes hanging's too good for you beast that you are oh harry don't don't let akira get hold of me screamed dane all his nerve broken down the law won't let him the law won't let him he won't trouble about the law he will send sailors ashore this very night and have you taken on board his yacht when you are on the high seas he'll deal with you no no theodore tried to kiss the man's foot and rolled over to do so harry spurned him you worse than devil try and be a man you murdered a poor weak woman and now you're frightened of your skin beast outside the wind had risen to wild fury the whole house was shaken by the gusts which came howling from the bay harry strode to the window and looked out he saw by the swaying of the festival lights that the miko was dragging at her moorings there was no time to be lost if he wanted to carry out his promise to the count colpster was lying limply on the sofa while theodore moaned and groaned on the floor on the small table beside the sofa gleamed the emerald which had brought about all the trouble let me be arrested and hanged i don't want to be tortured wailed the man on the floor did you kill my mother give me some wine and i'll tell you i shan't said harry then thought better of it and poured a glass of port down his enemy's throat now tell i really didn't mean to kill her said theodore and colpster raised his head to listen i followed martha up to london intending when she got the mikado jewel to make her give it to me why asked the squire looking very old and grey because you said that the one who produced the jewel would be your heir curse you shrieked theodore savagely you are the cause of all the beastly trouble i learned from martha in an indirect way that harry was coming and then i met him yes said the sailor bitterly and like a fool i told you too much you told me nothing said dane scowling your mother wanted the emerald for basil but i got into your room at the boarding-house you lived in at pimlico and i read your mother's letters you did yes she said that she would be alone on that night and would come to get the emerald i went to the house to see if she had left i knocked at the door but no one came so i went to the window and saw her lying on the sofa near the fire i called out to her and asked her to let me in she couldn't get off the sofa you fool cried the squire she could and she did i said that i had found out that harry had been killed by the japanese for the sake of the emerald then she crawled to the window and let me in you beast said pentreddle gritting his teeth you've told a lie martha would not have admitted me if i had not done so she got me into the room and then i insisted that she should give me the emerald she hadn't got it she wouldn't confess that she hadn't perhaps she feared lest i should intercept her messenger miss carroll on the way home and rob her of the jewel at all events she gave me to understand nothing and i really believed that the emerald was in her pocket i tried to get it then she brought out that damned stiletto and stabbed at me i wrested it from her and in the struggles somehow i drove it into her throat you intended to shouted the squire rising to shake his two clenched hands over the criminal i swear i did not panted dane it was really an accident 
when i saw what i had done i grew afraid i thought that i heard someone outside so you did interrupted harry sharply it was the watching priest if i'd known theodore scowled and his eyes gleamed in a most murderous manner but i didn't i saw that martha was dead or dying and opened the window to throw the stiletto into the area then i searched her clothing for the emerald and afterwards the bedrooms oh and you say you did not murder her raged the squire not intentionally i swear that i did not but seeing that she was dead it was just as well to hunt for what i wanted i found nothing so i came down and got out by the window just outside the gate someone that infirm priest as i now know snatched at my shoulder and grabbed my scarf i slipped him in the fog and and that's all quite enough too you shall hang cried the squire no said pentreddle rising and making for the window he shan't hang he threw up the window and the fierce gale came howling into the room i shall call up akira's sailors shouted the young man don't don't screamed dane they'll torture me serve you right said his uncle fiercely you have brought shame and disgrace upon the family mr colster the squire turned as he heard his name mentioned and saw that harry had picked up the mikado jewel i take this back to akira you shan't you shan't it's mine and the old man dashed forward with outstretched hands while the wind drove wildly into the rooms a roar of laughter came from the bound man on the floor ha 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 he screamed uncle you're done for you're done for ha 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 give 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 whimpered colpster trying to seize pentreddle it is mine it is mine it belongs to the temple of kitsuki said harry backing towards the window i stole it and now i am going to return it i promised to do so if akira told me who murdered my mother keep back sir keep back theodore roared with laughter and twisted himself round to see what would happen colpster his eyes filled with mad anger dashed at pentreddle who evaded him dexterously and before the squire knew his intention slipped like an eel out of the window harry clambered down the ivy with the cleverness of a sailor and saw above him the wild despairing face of the squire while he heard the loud ironical laughter of the bound man the rain was coming down in torrents dashed here and there by the wind the sailor slipped and fell on his back but was up again in a moment and made for the beach he heard high above the sound of wind and wave the thin lamentations of colpster who saw the luck of his family being carried away forever pentreddle raced for the beach through the furious weather there he shouted as he stumbled towards the pier and immediately two japanese took him by the shoulders to tumble him boldly into the launch they seemed to be in a desperate hurry for scarcely had he got his breath when he found that the launch was plunging at full speed through the turbulent water what the devil is a hurry gasped harry shaking the water from his eyes the answer did not come from the japanese who were driving the boat out to sea at high pressure but from the land there was a low moaning sound which boomed like an organ note above the tumult of the elements it grew louder and more insistent and droned like a giant bee the mere sound was terrifying and harry saw the bronze faces of the sailors blanch with fear suddenly the note grew shrill like a cry of triumph and then came a loud crash which seemed to shake the earth far and wide he could hear even through the tempest the splashing of great fragments into the sea and the crumbling of mighty masses on the land then came a stillness and the wind dropped gradually to low whimperings the cliff has fallen said the japanese officer it is the earth spirit this said harry his face gray with terror and showed the mikado jewel flashing in the light of the lamps the sailors fell on their faces before its sinister glare only the officer unable to desert his post although his face was ghastly white and his limbs shook continued to steer the launch seaward End of chapter nineteen